You've heard of the Nephilim, the men-eating giants described in the Bible that lived before the time of the Great Flood. Giants like the legendary Gilgamesh ruled entire cities in the ancient Near East. The old world is full of monumental structures that could accommodate beings of an enormous size and force and were probably built by them. Not to speak of the giant footprints that can still be seen near Impulusi in South Africa. In previous videos, we've talked about the impressive constructions on the Polynesian island of Nan Mado and the giants Marco Polo described in Zanzibar. But these cover just one tiny portion of all the evidence we have that tells us we once shared the world with giants. But did you know there were also giants living in America and much closer to our times, so close that even an American president knew of their existence? Many explorers and conquistadors wrote about enormous human beings in their diaries, so how could they all be wrong? Where did they come from? And why would a respected institution like the Smithsonian try to cover up any evidence of their existence? All this and more we'll find out in this new episode of Secret Origins. Welcome. Europe's Age of Discovery started in the 15th century after Columbus first set foot in the Antilles and Amerigo Vespucci figured out that this huge land was not Asia, but a new continent, which was named America after him. These explorers were not the first people to set foot on the continent, as they learned soon after landing. People had been living in America for thousands of years by that time, and we now know that they had been visited by several people before Columbus, including Polynesians and Vikings. This fact is important for what we are about to uncover, and we'll return to it later. But first, let's talk about the unexpected encounters 15th and 16th century European explorers had when they arrived at this new world. On the 20th of September, 1519, Ferdinand Magellan set sail for the port of San Lucar de Barameda in northern Andalusia. His goal was to finally accomplish what Columbus had started almost three decades before, to find a passage to India by sailing westward. But he could not have imagined at the moment some of the amazing and terrifying things he and his crew would witness on that voyage. Unfortunately, most of those stories died with the men who lived through them. He himself would perish in combat before completing the journey. Out of the five ships that set sail that fateful day in 1519, only one, carrying 18 survivors, managed to successfully circumnavigate the world and return home three years later. Scarred and terrified, most of the men declined to talk about their experience, but one of them, Antonio Pigafetta, had kept a journal where he described in detail the ordeal including the strange animals and people he saw. When sailing southward, along the coast of what today is Argentina, Magellan decided to disembark and wait for the winter to pass. The South Atlantic Ocean proved to be a tough challenge, and the men were cold and hungry. They could not believe their eyes when they found out that the inhabitants of that cold, barren land wore no clothes at all in the middle of the harsh winter. The first natives they encountered were friendly and cheerful, but they were not the only ones to inhabit the land. Soon after landing, the crew started to find strange, huge footprints on the sand and dirt. It was not long before they found out to whom these strange footprints belonged. Pigafetta recalls his encounter with a man twice the height of a normal person. He wrote on his journal, one day, we suddenly saw a naked man of giant stature on the shore of the port, dancing, singing, and throwing dust on his head. Captain Magellan sent one of our men to the giant so that he might perform the same actions as a sign of peace. Having done that, the man led the giant back to our camp. When the giant was in Magellan's presence, he marveled greatly and made signs with one finger raised upward believing that we had come from the sky. He was so tall that we reached only to his waist, and he was well proportioned. He called this race of giants Patagones, 
literally meaning big-footed, and the land where they lived became Patagonia, which is the name it still has today. Unfortunately, its giant inhabitants are all long gone. Without knowing of Pigafetta's diary, a ship chaplain in Francis Drake's expedition wrote in 1579 about meeting enormous Patagonians. The chaplain calculated their height at 7 foot 5 or 2 meters 25. Fifteen years later, an English sailor, Anthony Nivet, was shown in the same area the corpses of men 12 feet tall or almost 4 meters. Around the same time, Another Englishman named William Adams fought extremely tall natives in Tierra del Fuego, further south from the location of previous encounters. The last reported sighting of Patagonian giants came in 1766, as English Commodore John Byron claimed to have seen a tribe of nine foot tall, more than two meters and a half natives in Patagonia. Quite suspiciously, in later editions of his original book, the words were changed so that the Patagonians now measured 6 feet 6 inches or 1.98 meters, making them very tall people, but not giants. Who would want to hide the existence of these giants, and why is anyone's guess? The truth is that Byron's was the last account of the Patagonian giants. What happened to them is one of the world's most perplexing mysteries. At the same time as Magellan was on his circumnavigating voyage, Spanish seafarer Alonso Alvarez de Pineda was undertaking a less ambitious enterprise, exploring the Gulf of Mexico. Among other important discoveries, he was the first person to understand that Florida was not an island, but a peninsula. And also, he was the first European to see the Mississippi River. The first natives he met wore jewelry made of pure gold, and this sparked his interest in exploring the land next to the Gulf. But what he found instead of gold was much more spectacular. While exploring what is now Texas, he came across very small people that he called pygmies, while other tribes were regular sized and other still larger. His diary reads that they reached, quote, 10 or 11 palms in height, and although at the time there were different interpretations as to how much a palm really measured, it is a fact that 11 palms amounted to more than 3 meters tall. Pineda was so impressed by these giants that he named a river after them, Rio de las Palmas, or Palms River. In 1529, a cartographer named Diego Ribeiro labeled it on one of his maps as Rio de Gigantes, or Giants River. Today, it is known as the Rio Grande. Judging by all of these accounts, American Aborigines were always friendly and welcoming, just as long as you didn't cross them. This is exactly what Hernando de Soto, another Spanish explorer, did in 1542, and he paid the ultimate price for that. During his exploration of Florida, Alabama, and Georgia, he came to know of the existence of an important chief named Tuscaloosa. Thinking that this important leader would have many riches, De Soto led his party to Tuscaloosa's camp. When he was taken to the chief, De Soto was astounded. Although his people were the same height as the Spaniards, Tuscaloosa was significantly bigger, a giant by De Soto's standards. He asked for supplies, and the chief agreed to give him some but instructed the Spaniard to go get them at his fort, not far from there. The greedy de Soto then took Tuscaloosa hostage and made him lead the Spanish army to his fort at gunpoint, with the intention of pillaging it. Once there, Tuscaloosa freed himself and ordered his people to attack the Spaniards. The natives killed most of them with bow and arrow and beheaded the corpses. De Soto survived and later counterattacked, setting the fort on fire, but died anyway due to a fever shortly thereafter. After the battle, the Spanish army searched the scorched ruins of the old fort and found most of the natives dead. Among the burned corpses was the son of Tuscaloosa, but the chief himself was never found. To this day, 
no one is able to assert what became of the giant chief Tuscaloosa after that battle. Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés had been more cautious when he landed in Mexico in 1519. He found himself the leader of a small group of European warriors, powerless against the mighty Aztecs, a great civilization too advanced for the time. Cortés made a treaty with the neighboring Tlaxcalans, who were bitter rivals of the Aztecs. The Spaniards lived in Tlaxcala for several months and received women to marry, food to eat, and many incredible stories. The locals claimed that the Aztecs were a powerful rival because they were protected by supernatural beings, which they believed to be gods. But the Tlaxcalans were fierce warriors who managed to destroy a race of giants that once lived there. At first, Cortes and his army laughed about this, thinking it was only fantasy. But then they showed the Spaniards a large amount of huge bones, the remains of those giants. The expedition's chronicler, Bernal Díaz del Castillo, wrote the following on his diary that night. To show us how big these giants had been, they brought us the leg bone of one, which was very thick and the height of an ordinary sized man. And that was a leg bone from the hip to the knee. I measured myself against it and it was as tall as I am, though I am of reasonable height. We were all astonished by the sight of these bones and felt certain there must have been giants in that land. And Cortez said that we ought to send the leg bone to Castile so that his majesty might see it which we did by the first agents who went there. With the help of Tlaxcalans, the mighty giant killers, Cortes was able to subjugate the Aztecs. But those were not the only time giants took part in battle. In fact, many Native American legends speak of the gruesome battles they fought against an ancient race of humanoid giants. Eventually, humans won, and the giants were vanquished from their lands. It is interesting that they almost always describe the giants as having white skin and red hair. Other legends describe not one, but two main races of giants, one with red hair and beard, and the other with black hair and beard. The Chippewa, Sandusky, and Tawa tribes tell tales of a very ancient war between the two races, where the black-bearded giants were finally wiped out. Chief Tuscaloosa, whose name means literally black warrior, may have been one of the last representatives of the black-haired giants. The remains of these giants have been found all over North America in the last 200 years. In Ashtabula County, Ohio, a burial site with a number of graves estimated between two and 3,000 was found in 1800. Not all of the individuals buried there were giants, but those who were had a considerable difference in size compared to human bones. One account, published in the newspapers at the time, spoke of skulls with sufficient capacity to admit the skull of a normal man. The skeletons of these giants were found when excavating eastern mounds, these mounds are found all over North America, especially in the Southern Plains and in the modern states of Mississippi, Tennessee, Illinois, and Ohio. It is precisely in Ohio that the Great Serpent Mound, a three feet high and 1,348 feet long ancient earth mound is located. Considered to be one of the most fascinating mound sites in North America, it is famous for the finding of very tall skeletons by Harvard professor Frederick Ward Putnam. Professor Putnam was a fierce advocate for the protection of such mounds across the country, most of which have never been dug. Beneath them lies the unequivocal proof of ancient lost giants in America. An old Native American legend says that once the red-haired giants were able to destroy the black-haired giants race, their next target was the human race. But our ancestors were prepared and fought fiercely to the death. The Paiute Indians, for example, have a story about their ancestors and red-haired giants. These giants were known as the Siteka, a name that literally meant tool eaters. Tool is a grass-like plant that grows in the marshlands and wet areas of California and Nevada where the Paiutes live. 
Other times, the otherwise vegetarian Siteka resorted to cannibalism whenever they could capture some unsuspecting Paiute. They were reported to constantly harass the Paiutes, forcing them to live in fear until eventually the various Paiute groups had had enough and decided to band together to eradicate the Siteka. According to the legend, they attacked at once and cornered the giants, killing many of them and forcing the rest to take refuge in a cave. Once the remaining Siteka were in the cave, the chief Paiute ordered his people to pile up wood and brush over the entrance and shoot flaming arrows from a distance, entombing the vicious giants forever in that cave. For many years, modern historians have dismissed this story as mere folktale, a fabrication of lesser peoples, despite the fact that Sarah Winnemucca, the daughter of Paiute chief Winnemucca, showed two anthropologists in the 1920s a lock of red hair that had been passed from generation to generation. That red hair belonged to one of the vanquished giants, but still, scientists would not listen until an astonishing discovery was made in a remote cave in Nevada. According to the Paiutes, they naturally grew tired of being cannibalized. Lovelock Cave is located in the Lake Lahontan region in northwest Nevada. The cave was well known in the 19th century as a deposit of guano, or bat's excrement, which was used as fertilizer. Two miners were tasked with extracting the guano from the cave in 1911, but as they excavated deeper and deeper into the cave, an array of strange instruments and artifacts began to surface. Deeper still, the pair found incredibly well-preserved humanoid mummies of an enormous size, so well-preserved that they still had tufts of red hair attached to their skulls. More importantly, although they did not know the reason at first, the guano miners reported that the entrance to the cave was blackened, showing signs of intense fire. This confirms the Paiute legend. The two miners notified the University of California about what they had found, and soon after, the excavations began. According to the first reports of the excavators, inside the cave they found textile material, poles and bots, stones inscribed in a strange and unknown language, and red-haired mummies that measured between 6 and 8 feet, or 1.8 to 2.4 meters. It was supposed that the shorter mummies belonged to juvenile giants. Most of these artifacts are currently displayed in several museums of the area, but the mysterious mummies and bones appear to have vanished into thin air. The University of California reported that the excavators never left a comprehensive list of the skeletons and materials found inside the cave, but they were professional archaeologists, so this is highly unlikely. Someone must have hidden the evidence. A second expedition to Lovelock Cave was made in 1924, 12 years after the first one. Strangely, a number of interesting findings that the first excavators had overlooked surfaced at this time, including slings, nets, sandals, tunics, baskets, and 11 objects made of tulle and fashioned in the shape of ducks. These duck decoys were used in hunting to attract prey at the lake, and according to the excavators, were of an astonishing quality. The archaeologists tried to sell them to the Museum of the American Indian and the American Museum of Natural History, but they would not accept these objects. Neither did the Smithsonian Institute. They ended up in a small museum in Arizona, where they fell into obscurity, and it wasn't until 1984 that they were properly studied by the University of Tucson. Dr. A.J.T. Tull conducted the dating of the specimens, which turned out to be more than 2,000 years old, coinciding with the timeline provided by the daughter of Chief Winnemucca. This was the ultimate confirmation that Lovelock Cave was the final resting place of the last Siteka giants who roamed the earth. More recently, reports of similar findings started to resurface from the time when California and Nevada were not yet part of the United States. Before the Mexican-American War, in 1833, 
a group of Mexican soldiers stationed in Lompoc, California, were ordered to dig a pit for storing powder. Soon after they started digging, they were puzzled to find a layer of cemented gravel. They continued to dig, now with pickaxes and with the help of a few local Indians, and what they found next was even more astonishing. The soldiers unearthed the bones of what turned out to be a human-like skeleton, 12 feet or 3.6 meters tall. Incredibly, the giant's jaws had not one, but two rows of teeth, and the individual was surrounded by burial offerings. These included huge stone axes, coarse pottery, and porphyry blocks carved with strange hieroglyphs. As soon as the local Indians saw the skeleton, they panicked. Their chief came afterwards to the Mexican camp, demanding that the remains were reburied at an unknown location, to which the Mexican authorities agreed. Now the whole area is inaccessible, as it is within the premises of the Vandenberg Space Force Base. Mummies of ancient giants with red hair have been found in other parts of the United States as well, along with objects evidencing an ancient yet sophisticated culture. In 1940, another cave was discovered that contained mummies of giants. However, the United States government were able to cover it up, and only 60 years later, we were able to learn of its contents and its approximate age. Sydney and Georgia Wheeler, two archaeologists who worked for the Nevada State Parks Division, were exploring the so-called Spirit Cave. They were surprised to find around 70 artifacts and two giant mummies. They were buried there on purpose, judging by their careful wrapping and because they had been deposited over a woven mat. The mummies belonged to a male and a female giant. Both mummies were transported to a nearby museum, but to the discoverer's astonishment, most newspapers declined to cover the story. The mummies were then forgotten until 1996, when an anthropologist at the University of California, Riverside, Irv Taylor, thought they were the perfect specimens to conduct a dating experiment with the university's brand new mass spectrometer. To his amazement, the apparatus gave an impossible date of 10,000 years before the present, a time when no inhabitants were supposed to have lived there. But the machine was well calibrated and the dating was exact. Just when he was about to make this extraordinary discovery public, the Bureau of Land Management stepped in to seize the mummies with the excuse of returning them to the Paiute tribe, whose ancestors they supposedly were. Just six years earlier, in 1990, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act was enacted. The act forced all federal agencies holding Native American cultural items, be it artifacts or human remains, to return them to the respective tribes upon request. Strangely, Taylor's earliest reports of the mummies revealed that the individuals were not related to the Paiute tribe, and in fact appeared to be of Caucasian origin. The form of the cranium resembled that of Nordic peoples. For this reason, it is yet unclear whether the Paiutes actually asked for them back. In any case, the giant mummies of Spirit Cave were never seen again. But if they weren't Native American, where did all these white, red-haired, bearded giants come from? The appearance of these giants may explain their origins. Remember when we said that Columbus was not the first European to reach the American continent? 500 years before, a Viking expedition led by the famed Captain Leif Erikson landed at a place they called Vinland which now we know was the coast of Newfoundland in Canada. They established a settlement there and explored the surroundings. He had arrived there by chance because a storm forced him off course as he was on his way to Greenland. Some sagas mention no encounters with human beings, only that they found wild grapes, maple trees, and wheat, which they carried back to Iceland on their way back. But in other written accounts, it is said that Ericsson's crew encountered beast-like men, which they described as horribly ugly, hairy, and with great black eyes. These hairy men were said to tower over them, 
despite most of the Norsemen being almost seven feet tall or more than two meters. In these Icelandic sagas, these creatures were called Skelring, and most people believe that this was the origin of the legend of Bigfoot in North America. Interestingly enough, Norse mythology is full of stories about battling giants. The giants of Norse mythology were ancient and primitive and existed before human beings. They even mixed with humans at one point. Is this what happened when the red-haired, hairy Vikings led by Leif Erikson came to America around the year 1000? This would explain why all the members of North Dakota's Mandan tribe have red hair and blue eyes to this day. It would also explain why the giant mummies found in Nevada and other places had red hair. But the mystery of where the first giants originated is still unexplained. There is one theory, however, that is slowly gaining more support in the archaeological and paleontological communities, which has to do with the migration of our ancestors hundreds of thousands of years ago. According to this theory, the interbreeding of the strong yet compact Neanderthals with the very tall and lean Cro-Magnons resulted in a race of human giants that could easily have crossed the Bering Bridge into America during the time of the last glacial period, an ice age that happened roughly a hundred thousand years ago. That gave the American giants ample time to establish themselves in the entire American continent from southern Patagonia to northern Canada. Evidence of these giant inhabitants is still seen along the continent, from the Olmec colossal heads of Mexico to the Serpent Mound in Ohio to the enormous footprints in Patagonia. As we have seen, the absence of actual flesh and bone giants may be explained by the frequent wars between giants and humans that happened throughout history. After the killing of the last Siteka by the Paiutes at Lovelock Cave, sightings have become sparser, and it is quite possible that the last known giant was Chief Tuscaloosa. There was a time when everyone knew that giants existed. In September 1848, the future president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, visited Niagara Falls and felt so overwhelmed by emotion that he wrote in his notebook the following. When Columbus first sought this continent, when Christ suffered on the cross, when Moses led Israel through the Red Sea, nay, even when Adam first came from the hand of his maker, then as now, Niagara was roaming here. The eyes of that species of extinct giants whose bones fill the mounds of America have gazed on Niagara as ours do now. Contemporary with the whole race of men and older than the first man, Niagara is strong and fresh today as 10,000 years ago. Nobody who read this at the time would be surprised at his mention of giants, as all his contemporaries were aware of the earth mounds that existed throughout the country, which were burial sites for giants. They had seen the bones in every natural history museum, including the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. What happened to all those bones? Where is the evidence? The enormous bones of Loch Love Cave the sandals that are twice the size of the largest modern shoes. Well, it is clear that an enormous effort has been made to hide or destroy this evidence. Which takes us to the last topic of today's video. In his 2013 book, historian and researcher Richard Jude Dewhurst uncovered the gigantic and flagrant cover-up devised by the Smithsonian Museum in the United States to obscure America's true history. According to him, after the Civil War in the United States, the Smithsonian Museum began to adopt a policy of excluding any evidence of direct foreign influence in the Americas before the arrival of Columbus. This was apparently a request by the new government in order to achieve peace in the fractured country. They wanted to achieve a narrative where Americans were an ethnically homogeneous people, and this did not go well with accounts of red-haired and bearded giants roaming around. Others believe this had nothing to do with ethnic differences, 
but instead with countering the claims by the Mormon Church that the lost tribes of Israel were found in America. The truth is, when Major John Wesley Powell was appointed Chief of the Smithsonian in the years between 1879 and 1902, no major anthropological studies were conducted within their collection. In 1881, Powell designated Cyrus Thomas as the director of the Eastern Mound Division at the Smithsonian Institute. Thomas was a conspicuous supporter of isolationism, an anthropological theory that proclaims the independent evolution of each culture. In his view, Native Americans could have never had contact with other cultures of the world, let alone with Norsemen or giants. Isolationist anthropologists opposed diffusionists, who usually trace the roots of different peoples to a common ancestor. This competition was fierce in academic environments of the time, which explains the interest of the Smithsonian in hiding suspicious ancient remains and artifacts. In fact, there are multiple claims that problematic objects, including hundreds of giant human remains, were lost or destroyed in that period. In 1895, a giant mummy measuring more than 8 feet high, or 2.5 meters, was found in San Diego. The Smithsonian was eager to get their hands on the find and hurried to offer the incredible amount of 500 US dollars, the equivalent to $14,000 today, to purchase the mummy. When asked in 1908 about its whereabouts, the authorities simply claimed that they had run some tests and the mummy turned out to be a hoax, so they destroyed it. In 1897, John Wesley Powell mentioned to a journalist that scientists working on eastern mounds in Iowa had found a giant skeleton 7 feet 6 or 2.5 meters. When they asked to see the amazing find, Powell claimed that unfortunately the bones had crumbled to dust when exposed to air. Around the same time, in 1886 and in 1897, the New York Times reported on two separate discoveries of human-like giant skeletons in Georgia and Wisconsin. The reported heights were 14 and 9 feet, roughly 4.2 and 2.7 meters respectively, but on both opportunities the newspaper remained surprisingly silent afterwards as to these fantastic discoveries as if they were prevented from publishing updates on this specific subject. A similar fate was suffered by a mummy found in Spiro Mounds, Oklahoma in 1930. The treasure hunters that found it knew they hit the jackpot when, in the middle of the Great Depression, the Smithsonian and other institutions worldwide offered to buy all of their loot. Today, however, none of the objects unearthed including a pot filled to the brim with pearls, a male body over seven feet tall or two meters ten who was buried in full metal armor, are exhibited in any museum. And to make it worse, dynamite was supposedly used to destroy the burial chamber where the giant was found, although it remains unclear who ordered its destruction. Who knows what ancient secrets were forever lost thanks to the prejudice and bigotry of a few people. In this video, we have looked at archaeological, historical, and scientific evidence that proves giants lived in the continent of America. Several eyewitnesses describe them in writing, and their descriptions are remarkably homogeneous despite not knowing of one another. Bones of giants have been discovered in different sites throughout America, but they have been lost or destroyed by people who do not want the truth to emerge. We have also looked at scientific theories that could explain both the origin and migratory paths of these lost giants of America. The evidence is there for all to see. Whether we find the truth about it is only a matter of keeping an open mind and continuing to research all possibilities. If you liked this video, you would also absolutely love our related videos appearing on the screen right now. But before you go, leave us a like and subscribe. Keep your minds open, and until we meet again.